And I believe I'm missing Todd, Colleen, and John Miller. Unless and Frank, can, can you let me share, Frank? I'll pull up the agenda. All right. Hold on. Okay, should be all set. Okay. Uh, Frank, do we have anyone from the public? Hold on just a sec. Okay. I'm, whole, I'm using a, I'm in a whole different interface now. My tongue's out um, and everything. John <laughs> Miller's with us. I'll, I'll promote him. Okay. So John's on. And Ken Pruitt. And Ken. Okay. Let me pull this up. And Todd's on. Awesome. Looking for a D motion, Frank. Okay, so there's no one else and no comments from the public, no one else on? No, all set. And Don, no meeting minutes? Yeah, I had sent the 111, January 11, around like right at the end. We we did the other minutes, but we didn't vote on January 11. I mean, we don't have to tonight if um, I've got no comment. In. Oh, yeah, I, I did see that. Um, yeah. Did everyone have a chance to read that? Do you want another some time on it? I did well, not. I confess. If anybody yeah, why don't we hold on it then? I haven't either. I'll send them around with the, uh, you know, with the one additional set here. Don, it's really hard for me to hear you. I don't know about others. All right. How about is that better? Oh, that's much better. better. Much better. I put the microphone right in front of my face. Much better. Thank I'm you. I'm trying not to bother the other half being on the conference call here. Okay. All right. Winchester High School is nothing. Delete that one. And we'll go right into the Lynch. Um, MSBA ex uh, executed the agreement from Vivian. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to update you that the MSBA returned a fully executed agreement with the town of Winchester. So we are officially have our uh, project scope and budget agreement in hand with the MSBA and moving forward into design development. So that is a huge milestone and a great achievement. So a round of applause to all of you. Awesome. That's yes. you. And, um, and to the entire project team, honestly. Also with that, since we're moving on to design development phase, the MSBA has currently reached out and we are working with them in soliciting a uh, commissioning agent. As part of the grant program, the MSBA will be furnishing the commissioning agent but we have some work to do in correspondence and making sure that all the documents are in order in order for them to proceed in um, providing us with a commissioning agent. So Vivian, we're- I'll, I'll put this on the project drive so folks can look at it after the meeting, but do you wanna just say a word about sort of what this is that they, they sent us, they sent you on our behalf or vice so versa? Maybe instead of putting this one, since this is just the draft they sent us, I'll be making modifications to that document and sending it back to the MSBA. Our deadline is this Friday. So once I have it completed, I'll be more than happy to share with you, Chris. And I think it just would be less confusing if there's too many iterations. Okay. That is the document, that is the agreement between MSBA and the town of Winchester for the commissioning agent, soliciting the commissioning agent, basically Chris, the contractual language. Chris, please make sure a copy of that gets in the meeting minutes folder. Yeah, we'll do. And that's all the report or update I have from the MSBA and be more than happy to answer any questions. So Vivian, for instance, there, there's a cover letter, letter that went with that, um, and that'll we'll also make that available on the project drive. If you don't feel the need to go through the letter with us, just folks will, once we get it uploaded, I'll let folks know where that will be. Did, should I be putting that this stuff under module five? Yes. Okay, so that, that's where it'll go. We already have a number of MSBA documents that have been there. Uh, folks wanna review those, so we'll keep filling it up. 
I have a question, Chris. So when they come into board, the commissioning agent, um, this is they're presenting us, right? The owner. Correct? Yes. Okay. So where do they get the requirements? What they need to accomplish? Like, would it evolve during the design, and how does that affect so the fee? Mm -hmm. The MSBA is responsible as part of their grant program, they assign a commissioning agent for the project. They have a set requirements and criteria that commissioning agents have to be pre-qualified for to be part of their program. And from that, they select whichever one is available or best meets the needs of this project. The, um, the contractual language and the agreement that you saw is between the commissioning agent and the MS, um, MSBA, as well as it includes the town of Winchester. So the town requirements is what I'll be filling out uh, as part of this project. But in actuality, the town will never receive an invoice from the commissioning okay. agent and it'll be hired strictly from the MSBA to ensure that the project is going in accordance with their grant okay. program. All right, thank you. You're welcome. If, if we're not happy with the job they're doing, do we go through you, Vivian? You go, you go through me and I'll make sure that the MSBA is well kept up to date. We do include them as part of our monthly reports as well once they come on board as far as what activity they've done and um, site visits. So okay. if you're unhappy, by all means, please uh, contact me. Okay. Any other questions on that? No. Okay, swing space. That's going to be a little bit from Vivian. Hey, we got bid schedule for you. Yep. Meg and Tepe. So I'll I'll start for okay. the swing space swing space projects. That's a, a tongue twister. We do have um, bi monthly meetings currently with Triumph since they've been selected and awarded. We keep in touch with them just to make sure that all of our documentations and communication are flowing properly. We did receive from them site plan as well as floor plans for the modular where we're reviewing those along with their schedule. And um, on a you know, bi-monthly basis, we meet, we review those documents, but they're anticipating to maintain their schedule and be on site towards you'll see more activity from them towards the later part of March and where their trailer and fence will come up around the end of March, very beginning of April. Okay. Um, Meg, did you have anything to add to that? Um, working with Charlie, we're putting together the bid schedule for the uh, improvements excuse me, to the Parker School itself. Um, <clears throat> we're going to advertise the week of the 23rd. Documents will be available March 1st. And then um, we have a filed sub-bidding, sub-bid opening on March 22nd. And then April 6th would be the general bid opening. Um, these are all tentative at this moment. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't make it, but um, and then the idea is that at our April 10th meeting, uh, the EFPBC could approve the contract with the, um, you know, the, the successful bidder for that project. Okay. That's it for now, yeah. Any questions for Meg? Uh, the Eversource work, uh, is that, lined up for anything that needs to be prepped in advance of Triumph getting out on site? Uh, not so much in advance of them, but um, we are working with Eversource. Um, they are aware of the project. We have a work order. Um, I was Charlie just sent me a property line survey, which is what they needed in order to be able to locate the poles. So now I'm going to forward that information to them and hopefully get um you know them get get them to get it into engineering um ever source is a is a tricky mm -hmm. tricky endeavor uh, on every yeah. project i work with um it's it's difficult um so we're we're on it but i can't make any guarantees for them so 
Thanks. So keep you post, keep you all posted though. Anyone else? All right, a uh, swing space update from Charlie. I'm not sure I have anything um, okay. to add. I mean, I think that we were clear on the schedule and and um, and clear on the mission and the modulars are moving and so. Engineers have been out on site and for the swing space, so everything's moving along, right? Yep. Okay. Hey, could Frank just take a moment to just update the committee or clarify that, that the district is coordinating like the move planning. Um, Andrew's doing that, right, Frank? And that that's an allowable project expense. We have a line item for that somewhere. Yep, that's correct. So we uh, began that conversation. Teachers are actually kind of anxious to uh, get some boxes so they can start um, to putting away their fall curriculum materials and uh, store those, they'll store them on site at Lynch. But um, Andrew is, is working directly with Meg, I think we're doing an RFQ, Meg, I think is what you said today. Um, yeah, so yeah, we can do an RFQ. So we're on it. Okay. Uh, all right, OPM bid schedule review, we did. Um, so I'll stop sharing here if Charlie wants to jump in. Yeah, on the Lynch progress then. Um, okay, I will share screen and uh, see if I can. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to cover a couple of um, points quickly. Um, first, we were going to talk for just a moment about the issue of um, the well heads and that was a question that was raised and so we said we would get back to you on that um Geetha particularly had asked specifically about the well heads so we have two kinds of documentation we have on the left historic data that shows up to 25 well heads that uh were theoretically there at some point when this was all installed, we think. But I mean, this would have been a this is a vintage drawing from way back when. So you can see, um, you can see uh, what 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 um, VHB ultimately calls line A, what they call line B, and they call line C. This is the VHB diagram, and it shows three wellheads on C and. And it shows two wellheads on B, and right now it shows zero wellheads on A. And Meg may be able to fill in a little bit of backstory here, but as far as I know, VHB did their level best to find wells and identified them when they could. I don't know that there's any guarantee that those are the only wells out there, right, Meg? That is correct, yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is what we know. We know we have historic data. And we know we have current data from VHB, so that's what it indicates. So if you take that and you superimpose that onto our site plan, which I think was the question, um, here is our building, proposed building, and here is diagrammed out um, the historical data on wellheads. So this shows all 25 versus up here in an inset, in an inset the, the VHB diagram, which shows five. Um, generally, almost all the wellheads are outside of our building envelope with the exception of the end of the gym. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of how the, how the location shakes out. So I don't know if there are any real questions on that. Question, Charlie? Yeah. yeah. So I guess what I'm interested, I guess, Meg and Charlie, in my view, I believe, pardon me with the terms, they're calling these blue lines as a distribution lines. I believe they're shallow wells. Um, I guess the DEP has some records of the deep wells. Um, that's what I was trying to ask the question, which ones are those among these six? 
of circles. In other words, I also went to the DEP site after the meeting and I also pulled the well data. And if I go and do the search on my own, I found a sheet of paper saying, um, I have to pull it up to read it. But I think they kind of said in the DEP record, there are 10 wells and one of them supposed to be 46. The remaining, don't quote me on the number, but um, the remaining are 75 feet. So which ones are those um, matching the DEP data and perhaps the work BHP has done it. So, so I'm more after interested to know where the deep wells are sitting and how does it play a part as far as the proposed footprint goes. So that may be a question, Meg, for VHP. This is their, yeah. you know, they're, they're the ones who are doing this. They did the study, mm -hmm. they're doing the ultimate commissioning. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. ultimately doing the, the application to the DEP. Mm -hmm. it's, it's outside of our sort of scope. So I don't <laughs> honestly know, and I don't think our team has spent any time researching it. No. So, um, yeah, Charlie, if you send me this diagram, I can maybe have them show, you know, on this where they might be. Um, well, I, I mean, they, could, they're, they, they can show it on their own drawing. And yeah, I mean, those are. are the only wells that they found. So um, of those existing wells that they're aware of, I'll ask them which ones are deep. Right. Um, and to be just to be clear, the, the well field has been decommissioned. It is no longer a it is no longer a well field um, in the eyes of uh, DEP. Just that has happened and that's right. kind of an important distinction. Um, you know, the well, <clears throat> excuse me, those wells that are shown on this plan to the right are still there, but um, you know, they're no longer considered to be anything other than old wells. And right. whether or not we deal with them at all, you know, really depends on what's gonna happen in, on the site, you know. So if I could add to that a line of thought, Meg, I guess um, <clears throat> if we have the DEP letter that we received in front of us, and if we also pull the record that DEP has what the wells have been about, um, there's sort of a clause um, that they are putting here. And the angle that I'm looking at is we really need to know where the deep wells are sitting and how does it play a part as far as the footprint goes. And um, I have downloaded the PDF document from the DEP site. And if I read it, I was, um, I'm sure VHP would have done it too. And what do they think about the document and where would they cite it? I, I guess the next speaker, Charlie had it. And I think it would be interest of town to know where do those deep um, wells that DEP has cited in their record, where do they fall and what do we need to do about, um, um, you know, what do we need to know more? That's what I was trying to find the answer in my mind. But um, so. Well, <clears throat> I can ask VHB to do a little bit more, but again, <clears throat> DEP is no longer, you know, this well field has been taken off the list. It's decommissioned. It's no longer under their purview. Well, but uh, we can talk about it more later, Meg, but we can just pull the letter, two things, the DEP letter that they sent it to the town and the yep. DEP record, and we can, you know, flush it out, hash it out what is an impact as far as the technical information goes. And I think, and then maybe you can reach out to VHB and get some answers would be helpful. Well, maybe what would be most helpful Gita, is if you- So I can pull the DEP record if you want to see it now. I no, I, I don't need to see that, but if okay. you send me an email with your questions and I can forward them to VHB. Yeah, because mm -hmm, I think it's more like just showing it to you and we can sort of share some ideas and then you can reach out to VHB. Whatever way it would help, that would be good. So I yeah, guess- Yeah, because if you get line B or C, it doesn't affect the building. Foundation. It's not line B or C that I'm interested in. Is it has been in the record. There had been some 10 deep wells. That's how I read it. And they went up to the depth of 75 and one went to the depth of 46. Where are they and what do we know and where does it fall within, you know, within the site that we are talking about? 
That's awesome. Um, so in the HB's initial, you know, they're, they're reporting to date, they have not found any wells. Yes, yes. so, uh -huh. so this is another aspect, and I guess there's a record saying it existed, right? So, so two things we're trying to solve here, Meg, correct? Right, no, no, understood, but they, they they know that they have the historical data, but when they went out and did the field mm -hmm. of this, mm -hmm. they had to locate them. So if we're gonna have them spend more time trying to locate them on line A, the this committee would have to No, no, it's not like whether they're trying to spend at least we're trying to find out uh, you know, do we have any record of where were they used to be, right? In other words, we cannot go blindly knowing putting a building out there and maybe lonely hall there had been a deep well right so that's the answer that we're trying to find here i think so it's not like mm -hmm. so yeah uh, is what i'm saying mag it's just i do i see what you're yeah. saying um, right so in other words somebody some record saying no it was mile away because it was like a that that's the angle that i'm trying to push it to get the answer um, uh, other than that, um, you know, I well, wasn't, I'm not interested in the shallow irrigation wells that we are talking about. I'm more after those deep wells that existed at some point and where, so it's just trying to have some clue where would they lie or where would they, would it be completely out of the proposed footprint? That's the answer I'm trying to find out. Okay, so if you send me a, uh, an email okay. with those questions, that would uh -huh. be all right. Thank you. And we have Mark, John, and then Chris. So Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I apologize for my ignorance, but does it matter at all if there are wells on the site outside the building footprint and if there are wells, one or two wells under the building footprint, does it matter? Would there be something that we would do differently if we located a wellhead somehow buried deep under the field. Who's that a question for? Me. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a question for me. It's a question for me, Jay. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, having tried a bunch of different site condition cases in my former life, what, what we ought to do is we ought to just, we ought to take this slide and somehow include it, Meg, in what we disclose when, when this thing goes out on the street. And basically what we want to say is, hey, they're, they're, these are where we think the irrigation lines are. BHP was out there. They could not find them. Um, we don't think this has any impact on, on construction, but um, you know, here's, here's what the records show. So that in case, just in case something silly and stupid happens, um, we're not, in the position of knowing stuff that we didn't tell a bidder, but I thank, I don't see how you. a bidder I don't see how a bidder would even care about what you're showing on the second slide, Charlie. Right, that's a good point. That's if I could add, no, uh, they, those Miller. three lines are not they're not irrigation lines. They're, those were the lines for the drinking water wells. But yeah, I, I agree. Understand. On I, I understand, but just just yeah. just just lay it out there. Yep. So that so that you know. They, no one can ever say, hey, you, you knew something you didn't, and look, we got a bunch of water in this corner of the gym, whatever. I, so I, John, I, I can't even imagine that this is going to matter. John, Miller, if I can add to your discussion, what I'm trying to say is mm, there's a study that VHP did it now. DEP yeah. has a record in their system what the wells were used to be, right? And then we are trying to show what we know when the bid documents go. So when I'm trying to find the answer is DEP had in their record that there used to be 10 deep wells. I have to read back again. So all I'm trying to find an answer here is whether one well sit under the building or three wells sit under the building. We don't know what the implication would be. What I'm trying to solve here is based on the DEP record, what VHB had done it. Of course, they had come out and said they couldn't find it in the site, but then how are they planning to missing the um, missing the gap? In other words, there's a document existed. But, 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 say, Ethan, mm -hmm. 
Ethan, there's two possibilities. The DEP records could be screwed up too. So I like, know you and I can't say so, it that way. Just sitting here, right? I think we we have to do some more or say no, something. Right? No, but I, I think I think you wait. What you do is you you lay out for bidders what you know, what you think you know, what you don't know, and then you you put it on them. And and I, we don't have to have every answer. Of, you know, I, you know, these, these wells are what four inches thick. I mean, you know, they're, I mean, they're, they're little things. They're little pinpricks in the ground. Now, these are 75 feet deep wells, uh, John. I think, I, I don't know, no. maybe you, uh huh. I'm talking about the width of the pipe. Yeah, the diameter of the well that you're talking about, correct? Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we have a deep um, gap that going deep down under the building. I look at it as kind of a, um, uh, uh, I don't know, weak spot. Maybe it could open up any other can of worms. That's all I'm looking. This is, I'm not, again, not talking about the shallow wells. I'm talking about the deep wells. I, what I, do I, we, I, well, I, mean, I, I, I would trust our engineers to, I, I if, if you put a pinprick, just think think of this as acres and acres of site. If you put a four inch, forty foot deep hole in it, pipe in it, and it's abandoned, I I don't think that's going that's going to create a structural issue. But I mean, I leave it to the structural guys. I, I just don't see it, Geetha. Sorry. I think anyway, the kind of way I have known is you go at least you chase them and dig and find out more information. You grab it back, and that's the safest way to move forward. But at least I feel, John, you may, I guess, what have we done looking at the DEP data and what do we know and what, what we can do more. Yeah. So well, that I'm agreeing can... with you. I'm agreeing yes. with you. But... Yeah. So that's where we with... are but... right now. Yes, that's where I'm we are. With you. I'm agreeing with you, but we wouldn't spend, we wouldn't, we wouldn't delay the project finding these hotel, these holes. Nobody we, is delaying it. Nobody is no, delaying it. No, no, I understand, but there, there's <laughs> limits to what, what amount of effort is reasonable? I mean, I, I you know, I think that okay. they Yeah, we'll send the letter to Meg. Meg will send it to VHB yeah. and let's see what they say. Yeah. Right. Okay. They might Thank answer you. right off and this might be a no issue. Chris, next, and then Todd. Oh, yeah, I just had a real simple request for Charlie, but before I make, I just make the observation, these wells were driven 80, <clears throat> 85 years ago. Um, and I know I don't know if they're clay pipe or asbestos or what, but um, you know the material doesn't last forever. So some of these just simply may have collapsed on themselves, and that's why they can't be found. I mean, lit literally 1937 is when they were driven. Um, Charlie, I just I want to acknowledge Meg's comment since you know we do post these documents and we make them available publicly. Before, can you change the title of this slide and just say site plan decommissioned well field, since it was decommissioned in October? That's all. All right, Todd. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the comments that, that you know this is these wells aren't for the most part aren't going to make a difference. It's the ones that are underneath the foundation. When you start digging that area, you probably would want to disclose that there could be something to the contractors that when they dig that area and they find something, then they might have to yeah. um, fill it in. Right. All the rest of the area, I would say, wouldn't apply to our construction site in any any means to to john's point we got to make sure everyone knows about it when they're working there yeah i mean we've always talked about having the um the contractor own filling the wells that we know are out there so there is yep. going to be uh you know some documentation and discussion about filling the existing wells um so there we'll have an opportunity to I, I, get I as much information as we have. I bet they've collapsed. I bet Chris is right. Yeah, yeah and they're there. They probably have, and they are definitely asbestos because that's what we got rid of. Yeah, let, let's not make a big problem for ourselves by you know, going, going too overboard. Okay. Does that, that's our planning update, Charlie? Nope. Okay. 
<laughs> that, by the way, is well line A, if you want to know where A is. And the photograph is also a VHB document, um, but it shows you where they believe well A is in terms of the site. Um, I was going to talk, give you a very brief discussion of, uh, I mean, it really, I don't think, so these are in progress plan updates. Um, and I don't think there's anything here that's so dramatically different than anyone is, is genuinely really going to recognize it. Um, but, but these are the plans as of now, we are still working through certain issues like uh, pre-K classroom cubbies and K classroom cubbies where we're putting the bathrooms precisely so that's on that's kind of a conver internal conversation we're having now we're still working with engineers on things like where electric closets fall where 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 uh, technology spaces are um, they are all identified but we're just um, kind of massaging it um, we are also looking very hard at brace frames right now and where brace frames appear where this how the steel is being designed we've had kickoff meetings with all of our engineers We've gotten solicited feedback. We're integrating that feedback. Um, we're going to have another round of coordination with them shortly. So, but I think that from the thousand um, foot, we've also done a lot of work in admin trying to get those spaces to work effectively. But I think from a thousand foot perspective, um, these plans are quite similar to what you have seen. I will say, that one of the changes is that this floor now has bays and it didn't previously. So that had a lot to do with the, the massing of the building. It had also had a lot to do with getting to the right square footage and getting the uh, uh, the second, third floors to stack effectively with the first floor. But we like this feature. We think that it gives a place for small group stuff to happen. Kids love nooks. They love uh, kind of to have multiple teachers tend to like to have multiple sort of activity centers for the smallest children. Um, so we think it'll be a nice feature, but that would not have shown up in the schematic design plans. Um, one question I did have because it came to me that today in the gym, you had originally asked for some modest amount of bleachers and I can't remember what the seating was, 50 people or something. Right now we've got the, 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 the basketball court directly centered on the platform, which makes sense <laughs> uh, because that means when the, the backboard is down, uh, it's sort of centered on the platform. However, the reality is if you ever use this platform for performances or events, you're raising the backboards anyway. There's one argument to be made that it would make more sense to have um, a single set of bleachers on the, probably the right-hand side so that visitors could come in, sit, and then leave again without having to cross the court. It also um, leaves more space on the far side for uh, team benches or, or for kids sitting on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one thing we have done on occasion is to make the striping, the, the court actually asymmetrical. So it slides slightly, in this case, towards the left wall to leave a little bit more space for bleachers. But it also has a little bit to do with capacity. Like if we're just talking a single bleacher, effectively a bench that's fixed, doesn't come out, um, we may just be able to fit it on one side. And, and I don't know if there is an absolute drop dead number that everybody wants to get to of people who watch something in here, but it is a community room as well as a school room. So I thought I would ask you all um, if anybody has a view. And the bleaches are above and beyond the team seating, right? Team seating's within the, the lines. Well, it wouldn't be within the lines, I don't think. I think it would be, it would really, that's the. That's why I think having the bleachers shift would make sense because right now we're not really sure. I mean, this is of course not an elementary school size court. It's a full size high school regulation basketball court. So uh, it's big, but, but nonetheless, if you use it for whatever, JV practice, rec league, adult league, you know, you wanna have a full size court. Uh, John Miller has a question. I, yeah, I'm a former used to run youth, youth basketball in town. Are these are, are the are are there basket side baskets, two side courts? Is that two there are courts? there's two cross courts. So if you if you fiddle with the back and forth, um, you know, it seems it seems to me that you might want to put you might want to put some bleachers on the end. 
on the on the far end where the doors are. I mean, if you could, is that a place where you could you could fit you could fit an extra? Uh, so what area? what what tends to make us anxious about that is um, uh, we need the overrun space and we need pads on the walls. And we put uh, we've never done that. We've never put bleachers on the end because you don't want people running into them. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What we've seen happen is we've seen um, parents and all set up chairs on the platform and view from there, which is a pretty great, it's like having a luxury box, right? You get an elevated view, you're up on the platform, you can kind of see the see the cross court game happening. So my recommendation, we just, you know, that a little. The, the footprint of this is smaller, it's, this is smaller footprint than the current lynch. It's, it's this, not as wide, it's not as wide. Uh, I'd have to check, which we certainly can do. No, well, no, because it used to we I, we used to open up bleachers in 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 Lynch and still have the full size right. court. It I, it has to be it has to be smaller. But and, uh, it, and yeah, Lynch, I, John, I, I did you to... fill? Did you fill the seats at Lynch when you had bleachers? Yes. Well, the J the JV used to play there sometimes, and the freshman team, high school teams played there. Got it. So sometimes, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like rec ball. It, it, it's, um, I, I mean, I, I think I'd extend, I'd extend those single bleachers on the side, I guess is that's, you know, it's, it, that's, that's where we are. You're right about the ends. I was, you're, you're right about the end, Charlie. Don't do that. All right. Geetha question. Yeah. I just have a question maybe to uh, Frank, I guess I get, you know what the classroom we want and whatnot we have the teachers involved so in that along the same line of thought i was just wondering maybe with the specific question to the bleachers and basketball um whether there's a value of uh, whether we um got the input from the um you know the basketball association or something i, I guess for high school we learned the lesson maybe down the road they want something a something b just adding a thought maybe bringing them to the discussion, whether would add value to this? Just ask you, you know, where no, they want. Good, uh -huh. yeah, I know question. it's all <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's a good question we could ask. Um, uh -huh. I, you know, I think the idea would be that this is going to be mostly tap practice space and rec space. I can't really envision that either any level of uh, high school team would be actually playing games in it. So no, no, not the high school team. The basketball association, the outside yeah. town. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. they're gonna want they're gonna want it to be five times bigger. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, Charlie, the how many bleachers? Way. How many seats of the bleachers are you talking about? How many rows? I believe right now we're showing a couple of rows. Okay. I've seen it done also where it's like, you know, four or five rows on one side and just a couple, two or three on one side too, so that the the smallest side can serve also as the team benches on the first on the first row with a little bit of seating behind. Well, the only problem is if we extend those bleachers out, I believe we're gonna be on to the court pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, I, I think your yeah. Yeah. Su your suggestion to have the bleachers on one side, on the near side, closest to the lobby, makes a lot of sense. And you just leave if you if you need to make the court asymmetrical to just provide enough room for team seating on the far side of the gym. And then as to the capacity, I think if there to Keith's point, if there's I don't know who the right group is to ask if it's, you know, rec league basketball or if it's the current, you know, Lynch folks uh, who who might know best or if there's some uh, anticipated use that we haven't um, that we haven't accounted for yet that Frank might be aware of uh, any or all of the above might be a good place to go to get a number if you're looking for a number. There's. Gary Grassi runs youth basketball. There's 500 kids in youth basketball. Yeah, Lynch, I guess some days you go parking lot is full and they're there, Mark. So just a famous spot and to get them. Right. Do they, anyway, but are all I the parents, I, you know, are all the yeah. parents there for their all of practice? And I, mean, I, I just don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Chris, you have a question? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> just getting a couple of comments from Pete Lawson, I wanted to pass along because he, he's watching from the gallery tonight. So Charlie, I'm assuming the, the, these are given how little space you have on either side of the court. When you say fixed bleachers, in other words, nothing that's telescoping from the wall, right? Well, if it's a couple of rows, it's probably telescoping. It's just telescoping very modestly. So it would, you know, they would just probably be manual and they'd come out one row or something. So the concern, the concern that Pete has, and, and this has been an issue at, at our other sites is just, we gotta be careful about flooring material and that the carriage, you know, for the, for the bleachers match up and they're not wearing each other out. Um, and Pete was also suggesting we may need a higher grade of equipment here than what we have at VO in the, uh, in the gymnasium, which okay. probably means something to you because you did that spec. Right. For that. You mean the floor, right, Chris? Anyway. Higher grade basketball equipment is what Pete said. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Of course, it's three, it's public bid, so it's three products. So we don't get guarantees, but right. Okay. Great. Uh, John? Well, I was just going to say, I, 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 I don't know, Frank, I, I would think the freshmen still play there, the freshmen boys and girls. No, no, they don't go there. Well, they, they, don't know, they, use, they will come back if it's good. I know, I know. <laughs> they were there, no, they I, were there for 25 years, Frank. They go to McCall, I think, but not to. So the right. JV goes to McCall. I think they would, John, if there's enough seating, but I don't see how we get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah. Well, I'm just, you know, for, I, you know, for many, many years, the freshmen played at Lynch because it was the same size as McCall. The JV played at McCall and the varsity played at the high school. Charlie, you said if this is bigger than the usual, but that does mean um, the reimbursement that we are set for the reimbursement for the right rate, right, from MSBA? Yeah. So they did not contribute to the overage and square footage. It's excluded. Okay. okay. Jerks. <laughs> you, say you should think of think of the think of the uh, basketball court here like the Winchester High School stage. <laughs> Yeah, but don't they bring revenue to the town, Chris? Come on. They just flood it with stuff over the break and stuff, you know? I don't know. So I think they make up. Um, so anyway, that's the first floor. And then uh, the second floor, again, quite similar to the way it was previously. No dramatic changes, the same kind of topics in terms of us working out the kinks and things are still moving around. Um, but we're getting closer. The plans are more rational. They've been tightened in order to um, meet square foot requirements. In some cases, um, we're working on, you know, column locations and the like. And then the third floor still has our um, outdoor classroom on the roof and the other spaces are, are similar. The, um, you know, the special education is located on all three floors in the center, which is great. And the small group rooms are out in the corridors, which is great because it gives access to everybody. Um, and we have, of course, a STEM lab on the third floor. And then, um, as we have always had, the, the library and art on the second floor. And then music is on the first floor. So those are kind of the progress plans. Um, we also have a couple of sections that just kind of give a sense of the building three-dimensionally. You have not seen sections previously. So um, this is a picture through the gym that we've just talked about but it also comes and goes through the cafeteria, which is about a story and a half space. The gym, of course, is two and a half stories um, or three almost. And then uh, this, this um, section is through the media center. Nice thing that you can see here is how uh, we've kept the scale relatively low at the exterior, which helps with massing. However, you can come out of the STEM lab and look right down into the library. So we sort of like that visual connection there. Um, so some of the library is taller, some of it's much lower. Um, and you can see as well, music is tall. And of course, we always try to make music tall for acoustical reasons. Um, and then the, the, the bottom drawing shows you the classroom wing and there's our outdoor classroom on the third floor which could in future become a uh, uh, five classrooms, which would be pretty cool if it had to. And we're framing that all to accommodate that as a future condition. Uh, and and as, as noted a number of times, thinking about egress and toilet counts and the like, as if those classrooms are there. 
Um, so, uh, and then another section, this is through the main lobby. Um, this is art. This is the entrance below. This is the main sort of monumental stair going up. And then you can see the lower, what we've always called the lower lobby with the entrance to the gym, um, as we've talked about in a nice skylight over it, uh, and then going out of vestibule to the rear. And then this section is a cross section through the knuckle uh, between uh, in, in, in where the PK entrance is. So what you're seeing here is the pre-K entrance on the right. You come in, there's a tall space, um, and then you go under essentially what's like the equivalent of a crosswalk, and then there's another tall space on the other side. And then same thing happens on the third floor, and on the third floor, it's all glass. On the second floor, it can be railing. Uh, but what we're trying to do is get some bright light into that um, into that sort of moment where where circulation pauses. Well, it doesn't pause; you cruise right through. But it breaks up the the, the various grades and brings some light in, and um, should make for some nice views and some nice some nice views down, but also some nice views out. But a little bit of kind of more dynamic sort of spatial um, character. So that uh, is it on design updates. Oh, uh, there are questions. Uh, I'll yeah, there's questions for Mark and then Chris before you move <laughs> I'm just on. trying to get through this in a timely manner. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. These are great. Yeah. And the sections are, are really helpful to understand the, the spatial character of the building. Uh, one question has to do with the third floor outside the fifth grade, where you have the outdoor learning environment. I understand that you're trying to keep the Presumably, you're trying to keep the floor slabs level so that in the future you can just build out classroom space. But it does make for a pretty interesting and complex situation where you're trying to insulate and then build up, you know, pavers for the roof surface right. and then get so, access. Yeah. So what we're showing right now are two ramps, which means we have one location, Mark, where we're lowering, we're actually lowering the deck. Yep. So that we can, so we're gonna we're gonna come at so it'll still have insulation under it, but the deck itself will be lower, and we need to coordinate all the you know we need to make it very clear to the contractor that they can't necessarily run HVAC under there. It was not a lot of ductwork running around, but you know they they, they need to work around that. So there's going to be a funny little lower deck here and here, yeah. and that allows us to go out onto an insulated area. But then you're right. This stuff is all higher because it's got the no, it's got a deck to match the rest of the building in case of future expansion, and but then it also of course has to have insulation on it and pavers on it. So yeah, it's it's a funky condition, but it's the way we figured out you could do it. Unless you have a better idea. <laughs> no, that's great. I think uh, sure. make sure that you have a nice a nice drain right at those doors. Just yeah, to I be know. Extra sure. I know, I know it is a little scary, but I, I, I mean, I just, we can't think of another good way to do it. We thought about trying to do an interior ramp. No, this is the right, just, I mean, this is the right call. It takes Otherwise up, you have to lower the whole deck. Uh, so. Well, an interior ramp, you could get up inside, right? We did, we actually had a drawing that showed an interior ramp at one point, but of course it takes up half the corridor. Right. 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 which is just kind of a total bummer. So that'd be like the lint, the one the Lynch has now going into the cafeteria. Just takes up a ton yeah. of space. All right, Chris. Yeah. So two things. So Charlie, you can stay on that uh, third floor if you would, because I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I had a question there. So talk to us about what that element is on the left of the gym. Is that, that like a large screen? That right now is a big roof. So I we've proposed I don't think we've seen that in previous plans. That's well, new, we've right? talked about it. We've talked about it. We've talked about the fact that our goal, if we could do it, was to put a put a roof there um, because it did two things. It gave us some protected outdoor play space, but what more significantly it gave us was more room for solar panels on the roof. So if you look at our solar panel plans, they had had that, and we had talked about that as a option to see if we couldn't. Um, expand cap roof capacity and so um so uh it, it, so being, it have, i don't mean to be, i'm not being critical by the way i'm just saying i don't, I don't think we saw that in the last iteration of the third floor so it's helpful okay for me. 
So uh, th it would have some kind of, it, right now there's like a little half court basketball court, little half court basketball court in here, which yep. we'd still want to maintain. But um, farther down, we talked about some kind of, a, you know, some sort of a brace frame or something that, that would support the roof at this end. And we'd support the roof at this end with, with framing. And we think we can make it work in a pretty elegant way. But I mean, it literally is just a giant porch roof. Um, and then, you know, it, it would allow for this area to come out of the gym and still be outside in inclement weather. And it's not a giant space, but it's better than absolutely nothing. And I know that during program or even during visioning at the very beginning of the project, there was uh, interest expressed in sort of protected outdoor spaces. So that could be one. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then um, this is, as you go down to, um, let me look on the right side of the building here on the upper floor. You, you've got, just as you've had before, you have one, two, three, four, five classroom bays facing um, sort of the, the, the play area, fa facing south. Yeah. On the north side of the building, we've got one, two, three, four bays. You've, you've got this sort of a partial bay that's, you know, support space. You have that that knuckle there where the two wings kind of collide with one another. If you go down to the first floor for a moment, Charlie, um, you were explaining this idea of the bays and it is something sort of new, um, though it adds, you know, some measure of material and complexity and arguably cost. I was just wondering if you, and looking back at the previous versions of the plans that we've had, th there is, you know, considerably, there's like 20% more facade, let's say, that faces south at, at this end of the building than there is that faces north. Um, do you feel strongly that the, the need for the bays is as strong on the north side of the building as it is on the south? I, just given that you, as you were framing it, it's a way to sort of break up the massing. Do you, do you feel that it is as, it is as necessary on the north as it is on the south? Well, we can't achieve our square footage goals without doing it on both sides. So, um, so I think that we would have to come up with some other device if it wasn't this to make the first floor square footage align with the second and third floor square footage. But I would also, I guess, argue that part of the impetus for it was more around what it did for the interior of the classroom. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, and the fact that it gave it gave those classrooms kind of um, an interesting sort of varied place, and you see a lot you see a lot of schools with this kind of a feature because it gives a place for kids to kind of gather, and um, and if you furnish it, I mean we're not showing the furnishings yet really, but if you furnish it the right way, it can be a kind of a really nice um, a nice space for kids. So I think we saw it in part as of making, but I also would say if you can do it on one side, you kind of have to do it on the other side from an equity point of view, because whether you end up assigned to a North classroom or a South classroom, you kind of want to have the same classroom environment. Yeah. And, and then I, I just, I also, when I, I see the bays as kind of a repetitive element, it's probably just reading it this way, because I'm seeing the plan, not like a, a pedestrian level perspective, but seems to me the bays kind of build, they build an order right on top of which you've got all this other building. Um, but in the middle of, in the, in the middle of the building where you've got the middle classroom wing, we only, we have two bays facing South and we have three facing North. So it's not we're sort of building an order, but not quite an order. So I guess I'm just interested in better understanding how those bays really kind of, um, uh, help you with sort of the fenestration and the massing on the upper floors of the building. I mean, it's a three-dimensional thing. I'd be, I'd be interested to visualize this better when we can see an updated. Yeah. I mean, I think the last presentation on solar actually showed you a sneak peek of what this massing looks like. However, of course I didn't, okay. um, I didn't um, uh, focus on that because we were talking about solar panels. Um, okay. But the kind of massing was there in those renderings at a preliminary level. So we have okay. studied it a fair, a fair amount. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty neat. I think it's going to be a, quite elegant. And I think it'll be a kind of give this building scale. I mean, one of the fears I think has always been it's a big building, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been looking for ways of make, giving it kind of a school scale and a neighborhood scale. And I think this helps with those kind of things. Um, 
and this is much more of a human scale. I mean, this is, oh, you know, not much bigger than the bay on your house, you know, so that kind of, kind of would help with that a little bit for the kiddos okay. and for the community. That's, I think, just our thought. John Miller? I had a question about the upper floor again. Okay. I, I, I didn't quite understand. You're saying um, the upper floor. Um, those those are ramps going to the outside area and they slope back up. toward the corridor they slope they... up and this whole green thing is exterior so you're walking up that ramp correct and that's, that's outside correct i don't know it seems like to me water's going to go the wrong way the way we don't want it to go well that's what mark's point was yuck Okay. Maybe we'll I run. mean, the problem too is we need two means, right? We got to have two means on and off. So, uh, well, particularly off, and they have to be far enough apart from one another. So, I mean, we could look at some. Oops, sorry, that's my fault. Um, we could look at something, I guess, with the ramp parallel. But it's the same issue. I mean, you're always going to have water. Um, I mean, we, I mean, we are that. covering we are covering this, and we could do a little so, solid uh, cover over the entrance, but that doesn't really make any difference because the water is still out out here that you're concerned about. I'm not sure it's a giant volume of water because the fact of the matter is we're picking up the water elsewhere with the drains, so it, you're only talking about the, the the volume of water generated on a ramp. That's right. you know seven feet wide by however many feet long it is. How feet would long. you how would you remove it if, if it rains? Uh, you as well, as Mark said, you have to have really good drains near the, the entrance, which is a flat area, and it may be a trench drain. You know, it may yeah. be something a little bit unique. Well, it has to be unique because it has to be something you can walk on or or go over it with a wheelchair. It's got to be accessible. So. Um, uh, you know, we just need to to study what that drain is. I mean, I think it's solvable. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Keitha or then Emily? Keitha? Not ideal. Yeah, I just have a quick question to maybe with the plan of you and so forth uh, that we are seeing, I guess the technology has advanced. Would there be at some point or maybe um, sooner that whether we can see um, animation view of these things or just wondering that as we move along the design yeah we eventually we can it takes a little while to build but yes we can definitely animate the model ultimately okay okay um so would it be at the tail end or it could be maybe soon i guess we never had these kind of things in the past but just wondering the other thing i had was um maybe if you're done with the lint um um update that you're providing as i have two more questions um outside the building maybe i'll just hold that after that and then ask maybe not now i don't have a right. question yeah because emily has a question on what we're talking about now and so go ahead emily um sorry so not really a question but i have the same issue at a couple spaces i'm working on um and at one of them what we had to do was um, just trench the slab and put a walk-off mat right inside the doors and tie that into the drain. Um, so it was just a solution that we came up with because you can never totally get rid of the water. Um, so we just purchased one of those like two and a half inch deep walk-off mats, tied it into the system drainage. Um, and that's worked great. And this is just a way to keep the roof deck and not have to totally keep it watertight. Thank you. Yeah, and they do make, um, if you're doing patio pavers, they do make perforated metal pavers. Um, so in another project, we just replaced a couple of the pavers right near the door with perforated ones, and that just helps the water escape pretty quickly before hitting the door. Thank you again. Yeah. Can I just, Jay, can I just quite, quite Emily, when you, when you were talking about the walk-off mats, um, was that actually on the exterior or were were, were those walk-off mats on the interior of the building, like where we you might put, see them in an inside vestibule? We put them on the interior of a building like you would see in the vestibule. We just had a case um, 
where it had to be ADA accessible. So the doors had to swing in just due to egress and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so with an in swinging door, there was no way to get rid of the water. So everyone kind of threw their hands up and said, there's going to be water. This is how we're going to solve it. Yeah, I like that. It's an interesting idea. Okay, um, so moving along, I know that the other thing uh, was just next steps in terms of um, design development. I don't think I have much to add here. There's the schedule I shared with you at the last meeting, which is the overall schedule. That was the schedule I shared with you at the last meeting about DD itself. Um, we're pro having programming meetings this coming Wednesday and Thursday, I mean this week, Wednesday and Thursday with, with faculty. So that'll be exciting because we'll get their input and that may change the plans a little bit. It often does. Um, you know, people say, geez, that's, you got that in the wrong place. And we say, okay, let's change it. Um, we are st uh, working to set up um, a site review meeting initially with the district to talk just through kind of go educational goals around outdoor classrooms and the like uh, and play or and play structures. And we will also have, uh, we've already had one in the schematic, but we'll do another tech meeting soon with the district just to go over district standards and make sure we're on the right track for how to lay out our technology. Um, and again, the estimate set 222, the uh, Parker's bid set will come up right after that 31, and then our MSBA submission is scheduled for around 328. So those are sort of where we are with, um, with, with, with kind of next steps. Uh, and obviously we're plugging away on our cost estimates set right now. Chris. Yeah, so Charlie, do you, one of the things, you know, we, we had a really, I thought, productive meeting with your MEP fire protection engineers a week, week and a half ago. And one of the things that you've, you've said will come will be like a site civil, similar site civil meeting. Is that, do you want to have your site review with the district? Before that, what would be the order? Which foot goes before the other? And then Jay. Oh. I definitively think we'll have the meeting with the district first because we want to get district input and educator input, uh, kind of build that into the plans, and then okay. and then we can come to the committee and say this is what we've come up with. Okay, and then Jay, I think a question that we wanted to ask the committee tonight was: we are we're looking out to March. We've got meetings, we're planned meetings on March sixth and March twentieth for evening meetings. Um, the question for Charlie would be: you know, could one of those dates, if would the committee prefer to do a site civil presentation and have some extended discussion in the evening during one of our regular meetings on the 6th or the 20th? Or would the committee prefer to do like a daytime session like we did for MEP and fire protection? So I wonder if there's a strong preference because we could certainly do it in the evening, uh, but we just need to allow the time for that. that. I may ask the question then, Chris and Jay. Um, I guess, um, are you guys thinking about having, you know, sometimes to um, involve the kids um, along the line? Is there like some kind of a shred events or something like that to get at, at least to feel like they're in it too? Just wondering. Um, you know, I guess, yes, you were asking a question about the site civil, but along the line that we had a meeting last week as a committee wise, but just wondering. Uh, you know, just at the kids level to feel like they're part of it to to do something or maybe you know, we've shared with Frank what some of the, some of the things we did with VO with those kids, but um, maybe Frank could answer your question. I think he's had some I conversations uh -huh. with the LPA about that too. Something along yeah. the, you know, <laughs> sustainable. Yeah. Like, okay, this is the issue. What do you guys want to do? And then, okay. And um, I, I this is the short answer either. Uh -huh. What did you say, Frank? Frank, I don't think you heard you. Said, Sorry, think just, you did, just yes. yes. We're working with the uh, parents association with the school principal to find appropriate places to bring the kids in. Okay, that means like host by Tepe and then they would just feel part of it. So anyway, I thought just to make them feel big or whatever. Um, the other no, question, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The other question I had was, I know it's, uh, Chris mentioned about site civil, but yeah, that's a different issue. Are we also maybe thinking um, like some kind of a compost um, 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 
opportunity that it might work just because Lynn just sit um, surrounded by the field, just asking. Uh, am I pronouncing it? You know, the compost, uh, you know, that um, whether it would um, work in the scheme of things that we have, I, I'm not sure that it will lead to any lead points or something. Now the town is into collecting compost, you know, the, how do you call it? Compost? compost? Oh yeah, yes. so you're, you're uh, saying like, could we, could we incorporate like a composting site in the site? Yes, because I, the other day I was walking on the yeah. bike path and I forget that school that's sitting on the Lexington is just blending in with the nature and it just looks cool. And I was just wondering whether that would also fit with the site setup of lunch, you know, it's just like uh, tucked in and it would just, uh, I don't know is to do something small but very easy but i'm not sure along the line of lead points but something you know town is collecting well, now and why can be something that thought so along certainly with. um <laughs> certainly most of a majority of our schools have school gardens and it would connect to that kind of a program we just don't know that yet but i i would not be surprised if that's where we go okay um, Mark, ever, chris so you said with yours well, we don't need to make a decision like immediately, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, we talk about future meeting dates. It would just be good. Uh, ask if I could ask others, just be thinking about it over the next few minutes. Because if 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 the preferences would we'll just do it in the evening, that's fine. We just got to be sure we make enough time for it. I that's want a part to join too, Chris. I know I don't know evening definitely it will work um, because I think we may. So I don't want to miss the meeting if that's the one that you're talking about, site civil meeting. Um, so I would just favor to be in the evening, but. Uh, I mean, Charlie, you could you you could do that in the evening, right? We could you could have others. You could have your landscape architect and civil, if if need be. Uh, yeah, with 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 reasonable notice, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> I just think you'd have to kind of clear the decks of any other, yeah, conversation. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I guess at this point, I'd suggest possibly March 20th. Okay. But I just have to check with them and make sure that works. Are you saying you don't like listening to all our other business, Charlie, while you're waiting? No, no, I'm just saying we can't. I, think, I don't think we can get through <laughs> much else if, they're, if, they, if we do a site civil meeting. No, we, we appreciate your patience, certainly. Uh, uh -huh. 17. This but, is but that's what he said, Mark. It's exactly what he said, Mark. I felt it. Uh, so I just have a quick question, and it's a procedural one. I assume we're going to have access to the estimate set when you issue it, Charlie. And if so, Jay, what is the procedure if we flip through it and we have any questions or comments? Is that something that we send them to you or we talk about them in the EFPBC meeting? Or how, what's the right process yeah that's that. that's a real good question the past we we sat and hashed them all out uh but you know around the table i don't think that that's can right. happen but that's also I, I think a more work. efficient way to do it would be to, to compile them all in a list okay. and then allow the design team to respond okay i like that and i also just the caveat and you know this mark so i don't think i need to spend much time on this a cost estimate set is not the is not the the final DD set, right? So these cost estimate sets, we are always trying to cover enough to get scope, but we certainly do not consider them to be full milestone submissions because we're yep. six weeks in front of the actual full milestone submission. So we're giving the estimator everything we can, but we're throwing a lot of stuff at the wall too. And the, frank, the estimators don't care, right? As long as they've got scope, they're good. If they don't, if the detail isn't there or the detail's not right, they just need to know, you know, that we're put, you know, where we're putting brick or where, how much insulation we're using, or et cetera, et cetera. So, so sure. that's the caveat around cost estimate sets. No, that's that's good. And sometimes the list of questions is more just like notes for future conversations. That you know, if we see something in the plans that you guys haven't worked out, often the answer is. We haven't figured it out, but thanks for the reminder. And th that's a totally reasonable answer. Mark, can I also just offer that this is the perfect task for the, um, the working groups. So in the past, you know, we've had 
one for you know building systems, one for envelope, one for interior FF and E. And so Jay had asked the committee a few meetings ago just to reach out if there were groups folks were interested in, and um, I, we heard back from a lot of folks. So my hope was that perhaps by the March 6th meeting we can have posted. We'll, we'll share it in advance of the meeting, but. We'll, we'll be able to say kind of what the working groups are and who's on them so that if, you know, if there's an envelope working group and it's two or three or four people, you know, th that group can literally divide and conquer. You know, if um, you, everybody can pour through the drawings if they want, they can divide it up and the same is true for the MEP um, as well. And you, you can sort of work as a small group because uh, you're not a quorum um, and you can freely communicate with each other as well write up your your questions your observations or as you say notes for later um and we could park that on the google drive and you guys can you know through jay share it with charlie great great thank you so if, if i ask a question so for the cost estimate on february 22nd um like percentage wise what do they expect the design to be at is it at what 50%, 25 it might, be at, it might be at 50% DD. Okay. So the drawings would say 50% DD, something like that? Just no, they say cost estimate set. I see. I mean, that's really their only purpose. They're, I mean, they, they're, you are absolutely welcome to review them, but they are an internal document that's being given to an estimator to do an estimate. Okay, but the date the is milestone submit doesn't go to the MSBA, it doesn't go anywhere, okay. um, except for the estimator and our team. And the ultimate goal is to have a milestone submission at 100% DD. Okay. Which is not the way. So then, when with the MSBA, we then have a 60% CD submission, and that actually is a formal submission. But even there, the cost estimates, you know, goes out well before. I mean, it's just this lag issue. I mean, you don't. You know, you're halfway through your phase when you need to get the the, the estimate set to the estimator. But the same drill, the hill is getting one and Antepe is getting one. Is that how they're expecting? Yes. Okay. We'll do a reconciliation as well. John Miller. I just had a quick question, Charlie. Is, are you you doing this in uh, AutoCAD or in Revit Perfect. or where's the design Revit. being built? Rabbit. Rabbit. Okay. Cool. So I think I'm done. Hey. Staying on course. Um, we have the payment and authorizations that Meg sent out. We have to do this in two. Um, Chris, you want to share that? Let me pull that. Yes. Um, forgive me. I should have been a step ahead here. Uh, let's see. Pulling it up. <laughs> um, yeah. So Jay emailed this out to the committee. Um, Meg or Charlie, could one of you just sort of describe the, the, the scope of um, contract amendment number five? Um, it's fairly straightforward. Right. Yeah. What? <clears throat> no, it's just said, Charlie, you want to do it? Yeah, there's four items included in there. Do you want to do rock, paper, scissors to pick? Sure. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> so there's four items included in this amendment. There is uh, ACM services for the Parker School. Um, and then there's uh, the same services for the Lynch School, um, which would be for the demolition. Um, and then geotech services tasks five through eight and then uh, we talked about this a couple meetings ago but this also includes the parker street uh, not parker street the parker school and property line survey and right, so the, the, the geotech, for, sorry. go no, on go no i didn't mean to interrupt you that's okay and no, i was just gonna say the total is 256 230. And I was going to add the the geotech one is something you've already seen because we just we took took the first number of tasks of that proposal and no didn't go any further and now we're completing the, the basically the vast majority of the rest of it. Okay. So Meg needs um, Meg needs. 
an approval of contract amendment number five tonight, which I'm happy to make a motion on, but I, I'll wait unless there are questions from the committee. I have one, but is amendment four is missing from the list. And what is that? Oh, is, this has to be called amendment four. No, People amendment down. four was voted at our last meeting. That was the very, the some odd, I can't remember how many millions of dollars for Tape's contract to complete the design. And uh, that was voted at the last meeting. Okay, okay. So if you go down the list, when they listed, they didn't list the number four. That's no, the I items one through four listed on the piece of paper you're looking at right now are the tasks included in amendment number five. Yeah, yeah. Like if you go down and if you see the list of amendments, um, Meg, you may come down. I think there was a page with the list of amendments. No. Is there a page with the list of amendments shown somewhere? No. Um, Maybe I'm missing something. I don't know that I saw anything, but. So I thought the tap um the survey is pulled under here. But anyway, just to keep the numbers straight, there was a list page showing the amendments. Dear. Um, it's not included in the packet that I sent to you, so I don't know. Can you what... scroll up, uh, Meg? Do you mind? I'm not I'm not controlling the, the oh, okay. Chris's. Oh, what you want me to stop sharing, Gita? No, yeah, scroll no. up, Chris. You wanted you to scroll, scroll up. up. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to delay, but I thought it was a legitimate question to ask. But the, the document, yeah, was there a page with listing the amendments? No? No, the, <laughs> first, the, the letter the letter that Tape included lists out the items again. Um, but if anyone so, is able to share, so here's my uh, logical question, Meg. If I may ask, it would be nice to know where yeah. these amendments money is coming from. In other words, where's the check seat balance to keep us in check? Like amendment five, where is it coming from? Is it from the owner's contingency or designer's contingency? No, this is all part of, um, with the exception of um, four. Uh, yeah, task so four, that <laughs> the rest is included in the architectural fee. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to ask is if 256, is it being drawn from that master sheet? Is it coming from the owner's contingency or designer's contingency? That's all I'm asking. Coming from what's called reimbursable expenses. So neither, Gita. We have a line so, item that is strictly for architectural reimbursements for yes. various. So, so anyway. Mm -hmm. Jay and Vivian, you guys decide. I thought it would be nice to keep the balance sheet of that. So as we move along, then we can see how much we have drawn and how much is left. That's all. Well, I think I think they yeah. would update it, Gita, but they can't do that until we, I mean, to the extent we agree this is scope of work that we need to move on, then we, we would approve it. And then that sheet would be updated after yeah. the fact. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so those are the two comments that I had. I thought I, Amendment four was somewhere there, but not there. And then maybe, yes, nothing to hold on this, but just a, a check and balance sheet of where this money is coming from. So maybe it will give us a better sense. Maybe I'll add to the item three. Maybe is, if this is something proposal going back a year old, is it being updated to what we know? Or would it be beneficial to attach their proposal too. So anyway, okay, so. Mm -hmm. their, their proposal is, a, I, I guess I'm not fully understanding, but their proposal, this is the cover sheet. And then they do have their consultants proposals attached to it as a complete document. Okay. okay. Vivian, I, I think Gita is getting at, mm -hmm. if there were an expense that was unanticipated that we are now adding to the budget for the project, it would be good to know if there were an unanticipated expense that we were adding, but if it's, or if it's within budget and we have a budget for say civil work and geotechnical and architectural <laughs> services that we just see what has been like approved and included already, 
versus what might be new and added into it, if I'm understanding you Yes, correctly. that's right, Mark. This is like a proposal. I remember it came from Weston and Samson about a year ago, and we were doing it to the best of my knowledge. And I do remember seeing task five and eight was listed there, but I think it will cover better for us. We also attach the assumptions and whatnot that they have made. And I can, it's, it's, again, totally agree with you, Mark, to cover ourselves moving forward, maybe what the assumption is and do they still hold on to that assumption? That's all, I, th I think. In other words, attach the proposal from them and when was it dated, that's all. So the cost for these proposals are were already anticipated. So no um, designer or owner contingency is being utilized for it. Is that the kind of like the question? Yeah, I think that's the question. Okay, okay. All right, because it's like coming in as Amendment 5 and I'm just jumping into the contingencies. Right. Being okay, so that's the part what's sort of a little confusing me. Again, not to hold, I just said, just to, um, mm -hmm, when it's coming as a separate amendment, so was a little bit confusing. Me. So I'm happy to make a motion <laughs> that the committee approve contract amendment number five which includes asbestos containing material services at the Parker School in the amount of $24,420, services for asbestos containing material at the Lynch School in the amount of $132,330, geotechnical services from Weston and Sampson, tasks five through eight as previously outlined, the amount of $95,480, and then some supplemental survey work at the Parker School along the property line of $4,000 for a total amendment of $256,230. Second. Second. I will do a roll call. Frank? Aye. Lisa? Yes. Frank's not on. Todd? Aye. Lisa, aye. John Siciliano? Aye. Colleen? Aye. Mark, is there right. on that? John Miller? Yes. Don? Yes. And Emily? Yes. Okay, we're all set on that one. All Next. Right. Jay, I'll bring up the uh, payments. Payments. Notice back up. So, Meg, can you maybe just say a word about these or Vivian? These are yeah. invoices and their. Um, Invoice number 230106 for Tape Architects for the month of um, January, as well as for Hill International, invoice number 20 for the month of January. Tape's includes all work performed till uh, the end of the month in an amount of $246,900. And for Hill International, invoice number 20 is for the amount of $23,670. So Jay, if there are no questions, I'll make a motion to, to approve payment for TAPE and Hill International as the amounts presented by Vivian. Okay, second, anyone? Second. Second. Another roll call, Frank? Aye. Aye. Uh, Lisa? Yes. Todd? Aye. Geetha? Aye. John Siliano? Aye. Colleen? Aye. Mark? Aye. John Miller? Yes. Don? Yes. And Emily? Yes. All right. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Um, meeting dates we went over February 27th. Um, this is going to be a brief meeting. Um, and then we'll have March 6th, which we're going to try to um, address the memos I've sent out from Ken Pruitt a few times. So that we're going to plan on getting that on the 6th. And then the, we have the 20th, like we just discussed. And uh, April 10th, hoping to award the podcast if everything goes right. Good. Can we just remind everybody, you see the note there on the agenda. Um, it, it's really unclear what's going to happen on Beacon Hill or from the governor's office, but 
As of today, our ability to meet remotely is still scheduled to expire on March 31st. So um, there are, I think there were five bills being kicked around on Beacon Hill last session. Um, three of them look like they advanced a committee that deal with this issue. They're all very, very vague and they're very different from one another. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if we get another two or three month extension to keep doing what we're doing or if something else comes down from on high. But folks should just be prepared for us to possibly start meeting in person um, as early as uh, April 10th. And then we'll have to figure out, and we used to meet at town hall. I mean, it's been a long time since we've had in-person EFPBC meetings, but um, you know, Parkhurst might be an option as well for us, um, depending upon who's presenting. And there may be, you know, Charlie's not a member. He, he's with us all the time and Vivian, you're not a member and Andy's not a member, but if there's a way for us to meet in person and sort of pipe you guys in digitally, we might be able to do that. It just things we'll have to look at as we approach the end of March. Um, so did it, it sounds like we're okay doing the site civil on the 20th. Is that right, Jay? Yes. Okay. All right. I can get a motion from anyone to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you, Chris. Second. Second. Thank you, Mark. Last roll for, call for tonight. Mm -hmm. Frank. Aye. Lisa. Yes. Todd. Aye. Keitha. Aye. John Siliano. Aye. Colleen. Aye. John Miller. Aye. John. Yes. Yes. Emily. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulty starting up, but yeah, it's on me. Sorry, everybody. Have a good night. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Charlie. Good night. Have that was a good day, figures. Nice right, design.